Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone that's able to be out with us this morning. I would ask you to open up your Bibles, follow along with what we'll be talking about this morning. This last week, as with any time a brother or sister in Christ passed away, your mind, at least my mind, goes to one specific topic. It reminds me of our precious time. Not that as Christians we don't think about it often, we should. But sometimes we get caught up in life and kind of forget how just blessed we are every second of every day that God has given us the opportunity to be on this earth. And it's understanding this finite time that is so important because what it causes you to do is to use that time very wisely. When you think you have more time, you think you can push things off. When the reality is, we have finite time. If you'd open your Bibles to Proverbs, the 27th chapter, in Proverbs 27, we're told about this finite time. I love this picture with the fish. Because the fish doesn't understand that the water necessarily is going down, and he has a certain amount of time left. And guess who else doesn't? Proverbs, the 27th chapter, and verse 1 says this, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And yet, if we talk about it, I do think I know what Monday's going to bring. It's what every other Monday brings. Traffic, tomorrow's rain. It's Monday. You have the case of the Mondays. We have no idea what tomorrow will bring. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we do. Over in James, the fourth chapter, Verses again, you'll hear people uh, talk about these words and, and say them, but it's understanding what they truly mean, not just simply saying them when we talk about if the Lord wills. But in verse 13, beginning, says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. For you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. And also do this or that. If the Lord wills, we will live. If that's the plan, we will live. Understanding the precious time that we have been given and making the most of that time is paramount as God's children. I appreciate Eric's prayer as he was talking about this, that we be the husbands that we need to be, the wives that we need to be, the children that we need to be. Can you imagine if every single person understood that I am with somebody and perhaps it's for the last time I'm going to see them? And understanding the time and how precious it is, how many things we would stop complaining about? How many things we would stop arguing about? Things that we allow to take up our time? In Colossians, the third chapter, and then going into chapter 4, we've been studying this on Thursday morning class, and I just love this idea of, of truly understanding what this looks like as my life. This is my life. Jesus Christ is my life. What does that mean? It's not just saying it. A lot of people say that they love Jesus. Jesus would say, well, then keep my commandments. There are people sitting in church buildings that will say that. They'll sing the songs, partake of the Lord's Supper, at least from the outward partaking of it we do all these things but is he my life do i truly live for him he talks about in verse 16 letting the word of christ richly dwell within us with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to god whatever you do in word or deed do everything in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks through him to the god the father and he then paul says this is what this looks like in your relationships Wives, be subject to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be, become bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not antagonize your children so they will not become discouraged. And he talks about the slaves. Verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it is from the Lord that you receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For the one who does wrong will just receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And then he continues. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you have a master in heaven. 
Devote yourself to prayer. And by the way, people that aren't mentioned in chapter 3, he says, how am I supposed to act towards outsiders? How am I supposed to live? In verse 5, conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Your speech must always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Making the most of every opportunity. Can you imagine if we lived that way? Making the most of every opportunity. Making the most of our time. The time that we have been blessed with by our God. It is amazing to me when you look at the scriptures, especially in the book of John. The book of John from chapter 12 through and up to chapter 20 is all the last week of our Savior's life on this earth. The last two chapters are his resurrection and ultimately what occurs after his resurrection, the people that he saw. But chapter 12 to the chapter 20 is his last week on earth. And what did he focus on? If you knew this was your last week, what would you focus on? The amazing thing to me of our Savior is, first of all, he knew how much time he had. He could have done whatever he wanted with this time. Because he knew. He knew the plan. That's what was mentioned at the Lord's Supper table. He knew. He even would tell them. A number of times, John, the 12th chapter and verse 1, as an example, just so you know where I'm coming from, says, Therefore, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So this is, the, this is it. In this same chapter in verse 12 is when they go into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, and he knows everything that's going on. But I want you to notice verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled, and what am I to say? Father, save me from this hour, but th for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He'll go on and say, this is done for your sake. He knew what was about to happen. He goes on in chapter 13. And institutes the Lord's Supper, it talks about here. And then he washes the nasty feet of the disciples, including Judas. Including the one he knew full well was going to betray him. Is that what you do in the last week of your life? Then you go on to John, the 14th chapter, 15th chapter, and 16th chapter. And you know what Jesus does? He comforts his disciples. He comforts the disciples. He's going to face a horrible, horrible death. A horrible death. And he spends time telling his disciples that there's comfort. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you'll be there you also will be do not let your hearts be troubled he tells them don't be troubled it's okay i have to go where do you have to go i have to go and be crucified i have to go die and then i'm coming back for you but when i leave again i'm sending the holy spirit and the holy spirit's going to come and do what he does and you're not going to be alone and that's what he talks about in the next couple of chapters and then in chapter 17 he does this amazing beautiful prayer that we are allowed to read where he prays for the apostles and he prays for you and for me that will be united with his father. What would you do the last week of your life? He's betrayed. He goes through all the different things in chapter 19 and 20 that we knew, that he knew he was going to face. And he did it for you and for me. It's powerful when you see how much time you have 1,440 minutes in a day. What do you do with those minutes? What do you do with them? It doesn't mean you don't relax. It doesn't mean that we don't sleep. We're supposed to. God's made us that way. But what do we do with the time that we are given? How do we make the most of that time? There are things that happen in our lives that impact the whole day. It's just a horrible, horrible day, something that has occurred. 
But then there's other times where something happens and we allow it to impact the whole day. And we allow it to impact the whole week. And we need to understand the difference of that. There are things, as is a death, where it impacts more than just a minute of your life when someone passes. And it should. But the reality is, we can have something happen in a traffic jam or something we don't like that happened. I, I've been in situations when I was younger where I would actually allow sporting events to change my mood for the day. And if you live in Cincinnati, that is sad. <laughs> You're never going to be happy. But I would have let it affect me, impact me. That's absurd. And yet we allow other things to impact us that way that are just as absurd. We've got to understand that God has blessed us with so much time that we have right this second and that we focus on so many things in the past or so many things before us that we miss the present that we have. Amen, brother. You have right now to do what we can to serve our God. It is precious. There is nothing else that you have more precious outside of your soul than the time that you have on this earth. And what we do with that time is so significant. Over in Matthew, the 25th chapter, the understanding of, of what they were, what Jesus is talking to them about, what they needed to be doing for this judgment that was coming, he tells them, you need to make the most of this time. How you treat other people very well is going to determine where you spend eternity. Obviously, we're talking about as children of God. How you spend your time. He goes on here and he talks to people. They never saw Jesus standing there. When do we see you that were hungry or thirsty? When did we see you naked? And he says, no, it's not me. When we treat other people the way that we should, he talks about in verse 41, those um, that are, that are going to depart from me. In verse 40, he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer, Truly I say to you, to, what ex to the extent that you did not do... It for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous in eternal life. You know, the amazing thing is, God doesn't say, you need to be told to go and do these things. You do it. You do it. I'm going to be judged based on what I do as God's child. When I know somebody's in need, I go take care of them, I help them. That's our responsibility. As God's children. The beginning of this piece is talking about when we do those things for other people. Verse 34 says, Then the king will come to those on his right. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The kingdom of heaven is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What does verse 41 say? The place that people are going to choose to go to, to depart from him is prepare for the devil and his angels. Your choice. Your choice. And it's dependent on how we treat one another. It's not the idea of thinking about that one day I'm going to do that. I'm, I need to do that. I need to make sure I do that next week. This week, next week I'm going to do that. Do not deceive yourself into thinking you have more time. We have right now. We are blessed with right now. And we need to make the most of right now. In 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, Peter makes this point. He tells him in verse 7, The end of all things is near. It's near. Therefore, what do you need to do? Be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And each... One has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the multifaceted grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who speaks actual words of God. 
whoever serves is to, is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may prove glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I always love when the word complaint is in the scriptures. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. This isn't simply the idea that I'm going to have you into my house. That's not what hospitable solely means. You can obviously have people into your house. I can have you into my house and not be hospitable, though. I can have you into my house and go to bed. That's not hospitable. I may prefer it, but that's not hospitable. But the reality of this situation is that I can be hospitable to you here. Or when I see you outside. Or when I call you, when I'm serving. When there's opportunities that we have to reach out to one another. It's who we are. It's not with complaining, though. There's people that just complain. Because they're awake, they complain. And the scariest thing to me is I cannot imagine standing before God and Him saying, you wasted so much time complaining about time that you didn't even have. We waste so much time complaining about things that don't, that don't never happen. Satan has done a great job in making us think that we have more time than we do. And the amazing thing is we let it happen. If the Lord wills, you will have tomorrow. If the Lord wills. Now, this past week was difficult for the Mullins family. Last Monday, no one thought that that was going to be Dennis's last moments on earth. And we knew he's sick. This past year, we've lost people, young and old, to whatever things that have occurred, to various things. And there are names on that list that you may think, I would have never thought that 2020 was going to be their last year. We never know. When our life is over. And I know as I stand here. And this is what I talk about at funerals. I know we don't want to think about it. And we want to push it off. And pretend like it's never going to happen. I assure you it will happen. Save the Lord returns. And you need to make the most of every moment that you have. Make sure. That there are issues that you're struggling with. With other people that you take care of them. Make sure. That those people that you want to know how much you care for them, tell them how much you care for them. We always wait so often. People wait until the deathbed or afterwards, and I wish I had more time. You have it now. We are blessed with it right now. Make the most of the time that you have. In Romans, the 13th chapter, in verse 11, it says, Do this knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe." Now, salvation is nearer to us than when you believe. You have precious, precious time. I beg you to make the most of that time. Our Savior made the most of every minute he was on this earth. That didn't mean, as I said before, that he didn't go off by himself and meditate. He did. Didn't mean he didn't go off and, and pray or to be by himself for that matter. He did. He does. Or he, he did in the scriptures. And we can do the same. It does mean when the opportunities were there, he obviously made the most of them. And we need to be looking for those opportunities. Not solely waiting for somebody else to tell us. Look for them. Look for them. Make the most of those opportunities that you have. We're blessed with the opportunity right now, every single one of us, to make sure that we're right with God. Every single one of us. We are blessed with the opportunity right now to make sure that you are right with him, that I am right with him. If we can help you with that, please, please let us. If you need prayers, ask. 
as always, make sure that you're praying for one another. Remember one another. As I said Friday at the funeral, it's simple to remember at that time. Remember past that time. People are mourning over those that have passed on. People are mourning from those that have passed on last year still. Remember one another. If you have not obeyed the gospel, if you are not a child of his, I cannot tell you how dangerous it is for you to walk this earth knowing that you have precious time, knowing what you need to do to obey the gospel and not doing it. Amen, brother. You have this time now. The baptistry is ready behind me. If you understand and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I'm telling you, he is. To confess his name, that he indeed is the Son of God, that he is the Lord, to repent of the sins that you have committed, that I committed, those sins that he died to take away from us, to repent of them and be buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins, to be a new creature, to be adopted by him, to be his child. Now's the time. If there's anything that we can do for you, I ask you to please come as we stand.